Our next guest has worked in the field of journalism for many years. He has taught in academia, written for the most prestigious publications, and was recently editor of the Vancouver Magazine. Through journalism, he's been a keen observer of the world around him. But from his new perch, he has turned his powers of observation on journalism itself. Please welcome John Burns. So I'm here tonight uh, to talk about not why I left journalism, but maybe why journalism left me. And I'm sorry, I'm reading notes because I'm a writer. Or maybe we left each other. Maybe it's a mutual thing. As with all long-term relationships, it's complicated. <laughs> I worked in traditional media for about 25 years, most recently, as Sam said, as editor-in-chief of Van Mag. And before that, I worked at the Georgia Strait for a decade. About a year ago, I veered left and joined a local agency named Echo that uses storytelling and the techniques of journalism that I had learned to solve marketing problems, and I'll talk a bit about that shift in a moment. I got into journalism by a funny route. Here's a CompuGraphic 8600. <laughs> I would be amazed if anyone in this room had ever encountered one in the wild. It is a typesetting machine that predates desktop publishing, and this is the first computer I ever did real work on. I wasn't a writer in those days, but I made ads and laid out pages in the production department for newspapers. Stories and ads were typed into these behemoths and then printed out on strips of paper. I waxed them onto pieces of cardboard, uh, and ultimately they were photographed for the press. Ultimately, I became a journeyman uh, in typesetting, uh, and there is my certificate. And thank God I got it, uh, because I had a university degree in French and Spanish linguistics. Uh, and perhaps only the Communications, Energy, and Paperworkers Union would welcome me with those qualifications <laughs> and then an immense amount of on-the-job training, standardized testing, and exams. Uh, this is how I got into journalism uh, and what I understood at the time journalism to be and maybe uh, what I carry in my heart is the idea of journalism to this day. Uh, by the way, I have no idea if journeyman typesetter is actually still a, a viable career path, but I imagine competition these days isn't as stiff as it was when I fought so fiercely. <laughs> For that thing. Of course, here's the world uh, we're in now. This is Mario Lopez Jr. from Dancing with the Stars. This is a sponsored tweet that he sent out on behalf of his client Kellogg's. Uh, many people say this kind of monkey shines is what killed mainstream media, that advertisers no longer need to buy premium ad space. Uh, and what space they do buy, what we call programmatic advertising, uh, they rent from eyeball companies like Facebook and Google. And that space is so vanishingly cheap that the media giants can't make a buck anymore. So Mario Lopez and thousands of celebrities and ordinary people like him have stolen all the gold from media's treasury. OK, having set the scene, I'm going to speed up a bit here. You might think um, I'm going to bang on about how terrible this all is and, oh, technology boohoo and the end of daily newspapers, concentration of media in the hands of a few oligarchs, decline in reporting, confusion of news and gossip, decline in political literacy, the rise of Donald Trump, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <laughs> it's coming, baby. Those are all terrible things, but I don't think that any of that uh, is really technology's fault. Technology just is. Uh, the average Canadian spends 65 minutes online every day, uh, which seems very low to me. Uh, I'm way above that. I tweet, I Facebook, I Snapchat like, like you do. Um, I do have a problem with quality, though. We're in such a rush that we've become lazy, and we've had to. It's not technology's fault. Uh, there's just there's no time in the smorgasbord of offerings that we're given. Einstein never said that quote. Uh, for instance, though it comes up on the first page of Google results. He actually said that. Now, is that close enough? Probably. Does anyone care? I have no idea. So my beef is with the change that's not in technology, but in us, in the change in the standards not of media, perhaps, but also in us. Harassed by online, we've embraced metrics as a way to reintroduce quality into our discourse. If you can measure it, you can make it better. Yet. Our obsession with audience, that's this room, by the way, with capturing engagement and increasing engagement and selling against engagement is where I see journalism eroding and eroding very, very fast and perhaps irrevocably so. That CompuGraphic prehistory that I talked about was only 25 years ago. And in the meantime, yes, iPhones and driverless cars and all that. Uh, but the shift that really floors me is what is coming to replace the so-called mainstream media. And importantly, I say selfishly, the editors uh, who published stories that they believed would be of interest to the quote-unquote common man. Here's the first story I ever published, 1992, I think. 
Yes. The journal was about theater in Canada, and the story was about how seniors were creating political protest theater. So pretty on the nose, and I got 300 bucks. <laughs> Here's my first proper journalism job. I was a reporter for the Burnaby News. I covered City Hall, then I was the arts editor, the business editor, the sports editor, the op-ed writer. Uh, just for the fun of it, uh, this is my, was my business card at the time. Um, it's 1995. Everything you see on that card is now defunct. The paper, the news in Burnaby and New West is dead. The Metro Valley newspaper group that owned it is dead. I don't imagine anyone has the title reporter, meaning full-time print writer anymore. There's a fax number. I encourage you to fax me. <laughs> and of course, it's a business card. Uh, back at the Burnaby News, I had a good sense, though, of what made a valuable story. It was something new happening in Burnaby. It was not difficult. The audience was in front of my nose every day, and I was answerable to them. Today, every story goes to a world audience. Everything is uploaded in real time. Everybody has the tools of the trade, cameras, cell phone, keyboard, and engagement stretches thin. I'm going to hurry. This is Ted Sarandos, who's the chief content officer for Netflix. Netflix has become extremely successful by applying audience metrics to broadcast TV, and he's responsible, this guy, for the invention of a new kind of entertainment, specifically House of Cards, but dozens of other shows as well that pound yet one more nail in the coffin of traditional broadcast TV. He swims in big data, but that's what he says. He says, most of the time, look at data, but then trust your gut. Why? Because there's a gap between what AI thinks and what humans think, especially when you come home drunk at 3 in the morning. Speaking of data, these charts, they're from an excellent report from earlier this year by Madeleine Drowen called Does Serious Journalism Have a Future in Canada? And I'll jump to the main point of this, which is that uh, on the left, we see who supplied the content of internet news up to 2014, at which point a seismic shift actually followed. So top right are the big four, CBC, uh, Canoe, The Weather Network, About.com, which are 30% of the online ideas uh, market in Canada, and in the top, that's the top right, the big four. The top left of the bottom 13, the same amount. Those are the names you'd recognize, Global, New York Times, Rogers. The money, the right-hand chart, yeah, uh, is also 2014 data, Google, Facebook, uh, and in the tiny corner, the names you'd recognize, Rogers, The Globe, Tour Star, et cetera. But hey, that's boring. Uh, that's my dog. Um, <laughs> her name is Deirdre. She's just been spayed, so she's wearing a cone and looking a little dopey. And that's Deirdre as that pie chart of revenue, which is now really interesting. We don't have time for that. Stop it. Uh, over time, this dog chart will simplify. One dog, oh my god, will wrap, will eat another uh, as Google and Facebook swallow each other or somebody comes along and eats them both. So what's to be done? Uh, I would argue that we need to think deeply about the idea and value of engagement. How many times a day do we actually want and need to engage with other people? Because we can waste a lot of time worrying about the wrong things and tilting at windmills. If it's to be gossip about celebrity wardrobe malfunctions, sexual indiscretions, the tinderization of information, I think there's no limit. Go for it. Eat yourself sick. But let's not call those shareable, snackable, ephemerable stuff that social networks or media networks or whatever Twitter and Facebook and Google call themselves now, let's not call that journalism. And on the other hand, there's the kind of square, traditional, legacy, mainstream, serious, public good journalism that I believe contributes to meaningful involvement in society and good citizenship. Let's just call that journalism. That's romance and wedding bells and a life together. That's deep one-on-one -on -one engagement. Not that. How many times do you really want to get engaged? I think that journalism so defined by moi should be a public benefit, like clean drinking water, plentiful public parks, a functioning judiciary, etc. I think it deserves respect, financial support, awards, the way we treat documentary nonfiction filmmaking today. And through some mechanism that I think smarter people than me should deal with, I think journalism should be supported not by clicks and retweets, uh, and crazy sponsorship deals, but by a governmental tax framework that helps us to be better than we're often tempted to be. For myself, as Sam said, I'm living happily ever after now. I revel in not stressing out every day at work, uh, worrying about whether a million strangers have liked and shared every word I wrote, or whether I need to re-choose those words to make them like me. In my current job, we spend a ton of time identifying the specific audience for each project we take on, and we labor hard to build enduring paths to what should be the goal of every writer, which is pleasing not everyone a little bit, but the right people a whole lot. Thank you.